fan favourite easter egg to visit in KSP1 was the Bop Kraken, but did you know that KSP2 now has a similar, but much bigger and grander version of this? Let's go visit it in this video! The so-called Petrified Kraken is a new addition in Kerbal Space Program 2 for Science which released uh, this week, and in fact I actually made a video covering uh, the release of Four Science, and in this very video I teased the fact that I would indeed be visiting the Petrified Kraken, and I'm not going to disappoint, this is what we're doing in this video. I decided to slap a lander together using every available science piece, uh, forgetting that science is a bit different now in KSP2, uh, you can't use stuff like the lab when you landed because it's an orbital science piece. So this was a rather stupid design <laughs> to be honest. We've got the lab which can't be used when landed at the Kraken, I'm also going to bring a surface grabber piece, but we didn't need that again because we have Kerbals with us and they can grab the samples and it's it's the same experiment. So uh, mistakes were made with the design of this, but hey, doesn't this pose an interesting little challenge for me uh, to you know, land this kind of awkward lander at the Kraken site? As for the rest of the rocket, it's uh, nothing too special, though it is uh, a little, a little being a lot, uh, over-engineered. Uh, it has way too much delta V, really, for what it needs to do, which is, of course, to get to BOP. I've never actually done a dedicated BOP mission in Kerbal Space Program 1 or 2, so I wasn't actually sure how difficult it would be. I mean, I've been to BOP, I've done Jewel 5s and stuff, so I know it's not that bad, but I was like, you know, I really want uh, to create as much content as I can this week, so let's just bring what I know is too much so that we then definitely have enough. So we've got all of these hydrogen tanks here, we've got the biggest solar panels because of course Bob is at the Joule system which is a long 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 way away from the sun so solar panels won't be that effective so we'll take the biggest ones we have and for the lander itself that's powered by RTGs. With the spacecraft all constructed and now enclosed in a fairing, we just got to build the ascent vehicle, which is going to be a fairly basic bog standard two stage to orbit rocket. We've got the Rhino engine there to serve as the second stage, and then the first stage is a very SLS, well, it's not really very, very similar to the SLS at all, but it looks similar visually because I haven't done it yet, but I will be painting it orange. And we've got, you know, RS 25s, admittedly nine of them, not four, four of them. I don't know why I even said this was like the SLS, to be honest. It looks nothing like the SLS, but there you are. You see? It's orange. So, like and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually going to fast forward to the first launch here, because I had this really weird bug that I thought I'd share with you guys. Here you can see I'm about to run out of fuel on my first stage, so there we are, flame out. Then, this happened. A docking port exploded due to overheating, and then the vessel was destroyed. But it was, it's there. I don't really know what happened. I since learned that apparently docking ports can be a bit weird with heating at the moment, and since I don't think my flight plan was actually subjecting the rocket and payload to excessive heating, I chalked this up to a bug, and so full disclaimer now, for the actual real launch I disabled heating effects, and I'll re-enable them once we're out of the atmosphere. Anyway, uh, let's go to the actual real launch now. <laughs> Mm, the sound design and visuals of rocket launches in Kerbal Space Program 2. Ah, oh, let me tell you the novelty, it's still not worn off for me. And uh, look at that beautiful atmosphere. We've got that beautiful new uh, uh, boat launch area as well. It's really nice that they've integrated it by having that little road that runs to it as well. That road wasn't there pre-4 science. Uh, I'll try to talk nice and quickly now before it all disappears out of view, but now it's too late. But I guess I said my piece. I've already done a little bit of an overview video of all the new stuff in KSP2 for science. So uh, yeah, what can I talk about at the moment? Not a lot, I guess, because it's a Kerbal Space Program Ascent, which I've done many of at this point, and I already talked about how this rocket does not look like an SAS. SAS? SLS! But I'm leaving that mistake in, drag out the runtime. This is it! We're six minutes in! We've got 25 minutes to go, and here I am, already struggling. But it's fine, because once, uh, the, once we're in space, we'll have lots of spicy stuff to talk about, and we're very nearly in space, as you can see. Our uh, altitude above the ground is 40 kilometers and rising rapidly. And there is stage separation, so we can fire up the Rhino engine. 
Uh, I love watching the uh, booster spiral away in the background. It's one of those things that I can't really look at when I'm playing the game because I'm just hyper fixated on the nav ball. But then watching things back in the edit, obviously with the footage sped up as well to make things nice and punchy. I don't know, it's just something I really enjoy looking at, just watching the little spent stages go tumbling away into the background. Uh, there go the fairings, which as you can see are still broken, they don't deploy properly. And speaking of things that are broken, my orbital lines had disappeared. I made a quick save and quick load and it didn't work, so I had to uh, do a bit of hacking, did some save file editing. Uh, when I opened my save file, the game had got this vessel's state as being landed when in fact it needs to be orbiting. So if you have this problem, just make a quick save like, I don't know, fix orbital lines, locate it in your save files, and then just press Control F and look for vessel state. Usually that's the thing that's wrong. There are a couple of things that can kind of mess up to get rid of your orbital lines, but I feel like, at least in my experience, nine times out of 10, it's because the game has just got your vessel state still assigned as being landed. Uh, but honestly, this is not the time and place to be discussing how to do save file, you know, fixing. Uh, just Google the problem. There's a lot of forum threads at this point that tell you how to do it in much better detail than I ever could explain. Anyway, as you can see, I said earlier, I hope, I hope I said <laughs> that this is an Apollo style mission. I mean, it doesn't resemble the Apollo program whatsoever, but it does in the sense that we have the command pod uh, above the lander during the launch. And then once we're kind of in space, we can then separate it all, flip the mothership around, redock with the lander and there you have it. It's all done. I uh, didn't bother deorbiting the second stage because, uh, frankly, I, I couldn't be bothered. And uh, this is just like a temporary save I made. This isn't like my actual save I'm going to be using going forward. So I don't care that much about orbital debris. And if this were real life, orbital decay would be a thing, right? So that second stage would just fall back into the atmosphere eventually. So I don't feel too guilty about it. Whatever, you know. Another benefit to having the Apollo-style configuration is that now the uh, habitable space of the spaceship, I guess, is much larger. Kerbals can freely transfer from that command pod into the lander can and indeed the laboratory piece below it, or Star Lab, as I should say, to give it its proper name. So you've got lots of room to move around on their multi-year voyage to Jewel. It's, uh, it's, it's probably still a little bit inhumane, the quarters that I've provided, but, you know, we're on a mission here. We're on a time budget, okay? It's a busy week. It's the run-up to Christmas. It's my girlfriend's birthday this week as well. And, you know, that actually, that, that's all of my... And to be fair, I had to make my four science video. And I had to, like, play the game and get used to figure out how it all worked so I could make an informative video and not misinform people, which I probably accidentally did. Sorry if I did. But I, I, I like to think I fact-checked my video pretty well. Anyway, here we are, uh, plotting a maneuver node to get circularized around Joule. I've not done this in KSP2 yet, but I always do this in KSP1, and that is use Tylo's massive gravity well to do a gravity assist and get a capture around Joule for essentially free. It was a lot harder to do this in KSP2 because the uh, little separation nodes that tell you kind of how far away from your target you are when you're planning the maneuver node weren't showing up. I don't know if that's like a patched, uh, like a patched conics issue and I need to do something in the settings. Uh, so really this is like a cry of help. If you guys know what I should have done, let me know. I'm all ears. I'm too lazy to check at this point. I just sort of played around with the maneuver node for ages until I got what I wanted to have and you know, that was it. Another sort of thing that kind of relates to the packaged conics thing was that, well, it's not there now because we've now entered Jules sphere of influence. But before we did, uh, my orbital line after Tylo disappeared. So I guess the game can only show three hops into the future, right? Your current sphere of influence trajectory, the next sphere of influence trajectory, and then the third one. After that, it won't then show the line, even though the maneuver node did. I hope this makes sense to everyone because I feel like as I was explaining that my head was just saying like this is really confusing and difficult to explain but I hope the people who play Kerbal Space Program and know what I'm talking about can visualize it and even if you're not sure you probably figured out something was off when you looked at the footage on screen I hope make sure you like the video guys support this amazing high quality commentary content by the way and uh yeah have you how, how how are you how are you how are you i feel like this has been a very one-sided conversation i'm sorry this has been very rude of me oh look we're entering tylo's sphere of influence i thought i'd just run the orbital lab 
Forgot to add an antenna, so we can't transmit anything back to the KSC, but it's fine. Uh, but yeah, as I was saying, I've been very selfish. I'm, I've been thinking about myself, just talking about myself. How are you? Have you been enjoying Kerbal Space Program 2 for science? Where's your favourite, what's your favourite place you've been to so far, if you are? For me personally, this is actually like the first big mission I've done. <laughs> you know, I was just like trying to play the game, do the contracts and figure out how it all worked, which is just like basic stuff. I haven't had that much time to play it. I feel like uh, some of my content creator colleagues put a bit more out, put a few more hours into Foresights than I managed to in the run up to release. So I was only really going to like low Kerbin orbit and the Mun. Uh, so <laughs> this is the first time I'm going somewhere a bit further. And ironically, it's the first time I've had major bugs happen as well, like the orbital lines happening. Never had that once <laughs> in the uh, run-up when I had my uh, early access copy of 4Science. So, yeah. Oh, I should probably say full disclaimer. I captured this footage on Monday the 18th of December. So this was actually captured before the public release of 4Science. So I really should say for full transparency's sake that this was an early access build. There might be bugs and problems and issues and things in this video that no longer exist in the game. I don't know though, I have said this thing before when I've had early access versions of KSP2 and then they ended up not being true, those bugs still persisted in the game. See all of my bold claims about the pause, unpause bug definitely not being there uh, at the initial release and then we all know how uh, the uh, initial release of um, Kerbal Space Program 2 went. But luckily those days are hopefully well behind us. I did make sure to preserve a copy of the release version of Kerbal Space Program 2, just in case in the future Take Two Interactive or Intercept Games or someone somewhere decides to remove the very, very early versions of KSP from Steam. I don't know if you guys know this, but in games like KSP 2 that receive updates and stuff on Steam, you can actually uh, go onto like the betas tab in the game and just downgrade it to any previous version. And right now, you can still downgrade. I don't know why you'd want to, but you can still downgrade KSP2 to the very first version. The only reason I've archived it is because I think it might make a fun video to do in like a few years time. Like once the game is like very, very far down the line, if not complete, I don't know when I plan to do this hypothetical video if I ever will. Uh, I can then do like a re let's let's revisit the absolute disaster that was the uh, initial Kerbal Space Program release video. So do you think that's a fun idea? I think it's a... I think it's a pretty fun sounding idea. Anyway, look at this. We are arriving at Bop and circularizing. I feel like I didn't talk about anything on screen for that entire process, but I feel like, you know, you could figure it out <laughs> watching the thing. Now, I'm going to show you how to find this giant petrified kraken. So here we are in the tracking station. The big thing on Bop is that massive, massive flat crater. So get it so you look at it at this angle, then wait for the planet planet. Wait for the moon to rotate a little bit. you got a big crater just after the really, really big one. That's our first landmark to help guide us to the Kraken. Then there's another one to the left of it. And then below that one, there's three craters. That's kind of the main visual indicator of where the Kraken is. And then just below and to the right of those three, if you can just about make it out, there is another crater. And that is the crater that has the Kraken inside it. So that's, that's how you find it. Or you could just use the cheat menu and go to these coordinates. What? One of the two. Anyway, with our target acquired, we can leave the tracking station and go back to the, uh... Okay. The, oh. What is this screen called? The game screen? I never even thought about what this... <laughs> was like, go to the tracking station and then... To space, I guess. Dunno. Bit of an inconsequential thing to be worrying about at this stage when we've got a petrified kraken to locate. So... I hope you remember that visual guide that I supplied earlier. Uh, we're aiming for that little faint crater there that I'm sort of putting my trajectory into. And then we're extending it a little bit ahead because I'm taking into account the fact that Bop rotates. But probably didn't need to do that because Bop rotates very, very slowly. And this is one of the things that I really miss about KSP1 with mods. And that is time warp control mods, be it time control or better time warp or any other time warp mod that exists. Those are the only two that I'm personally familiar with. And that is that the game will forcibly restrict how much you can time warp when you're close to the surface of a celestial body. Which, you know, well-intentioned, right? But the problem is, is that with Bop, 
and other small bodies like Gilly, and I guess even Minmus to a, to a kind of an extent, is that the highest speed of time that we have available to us is still not very fast. So it just takes absolutely ages to get down to the surface because Bop's not pulling us towards it very quickly because it's a low gravity body. But look, I've only got three notches of time warp there. So I'm literally, like, the footage is being played back at times four speed because I am, of course, a benevolent content creator and don't want to subject you guys to this. But it just takes ages. I wish we could, like, maybe there's, like, a, a settings menu we could have so that we can disable the time warp limitation when you're close to the surface of a celestial body. That's something that I would really like. Or hopefully we just get better time warp for KSP2. But I feel like we're going to get a few patches back to back fairly soon because there have been a few new bugs introduced with 4Science. And when those patches come out, they will inevitably break all the mods. And so stuff like this, which is actually, I would consider, basically essential for game enjoyment, I'd rather rely on stock solutions. Uh, by the way, my landing legs weren't deploying, so I did a quick save, quick load. Now they are. Why am I deploying the landing legs? Well, just see it. Just see it below us. It's the petrified kraken. Uh, absolutely mahusive. Uh, much, much bigger than the one in KSP1. So there you are. KSP2, now officially the better game, because the Kraken is bigger. Huh. Maybe that maybe that actually says something, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> uh, considering the game was uh, quite catastrophically broken upon launch. And let's be real, very, very welcome improvements have been made. The game is far less buggy, but there are still a ways to go. There are still things like orbital decay, phantom forces, and other kind of annoying bugs, such as landing gear not deploying. But, you know... I didn't sink through the ground, which sometimes happened in early releases of KSP2. Hasn't happened to me in a while, so hopefully maybe it's one of the things that's fixed. I'm, I'm getting overly negative again. I should be talking about the focus of this video, which is currently on screen. And that is the... Well, actually, it's a bit blocked by the parts manager. Here I am doing some science experiments. It was this point, I can't believe it took me this long to realise this later on in the mission, that I couldn't actually use my orbital lab because it's an orbital lab. It can only be run in orbit. And... I also made a critical blunder because you need two Kerbals to operate the lab, which I thought, fine, we got two Kerbals with us. But when both of my Kerbals were in the lab, there's no Kerbal in a command pod, and then the lab doesn't work because it just says your vessel has no control. So, pro tip, if you want to use the orbital lab, make sure there is another Kerbal somewhere else on your ship inside a command pod unit, or have a probe core that's got a connection to the Kerbal Space Center, if you've got that setting enabled that means that probes have to have a connection to the KSC. Just a little, a little pro tip there. But look at this, we are dunking on the Kraken! Is that still a relevant phrase that they say nowadays? I don't know, but yep, I'm planting a flag on one of the Kraken's, uh, things? Tendrils? Don't know what they are. Are there any marine biologists in the comments? Let me know in the comment section below what this, uh, thing I'm standing on is, but uh, see the Kerbal was probably very bored, that was a big yawn. But look at that, isn't that so cool? I'm really really excited for these massive easter eggs, well I shouldn't say, shouldn't say easter eggs should I, because they're uh, discoverables. Uh, because you can in fact discover them, you don't need videos like this, at least for, you know, some of them, I don't know if they'll eventually be a thing for all of them, but if you just play through the uh, missions in exploration mode, you'll get contracts saying go visit the Mun Monument or something, and then it will show you where it is on the map screen. I think, I, I don't actually know to be fair, but I've seen gameplay and that's what it looks like. I just haven't played enough of career mode. I keep calling it career mode. All habits die hard. I'm sorry. I haven't played enough exploration mode thus far to get that far into the missions where I get a mission like that. But so, you know, you don't, again, again, guys, this video is not a tutorial. Do not take it as such. This, everything you see before you is an entire, is a, it's a work of fiction. So um, this Easter egg isn't actually even in the game. I It's a mod. It's a mod. I modded it in. And there we are, look at that! It's the it's the shot I used in the intro, but now the Kraken is not censored because you guys you guys suffered this far. You you deserve to see what it looks like. Anyway, we're getting our Kerbals back onto the ship. Uh, the, the land did a bit of a jump just there. It's because I dropped out of time warp back to, I guess, so physics kicked back in and it kicked the lander up a little bit. That was something that happened in KSP1, to be fair. So I'm not going to hold it against KSP2 too much. 
Anyway, I think that concludes our surface shenanigans. Now we need to think about getting back to the command module that's currently in orbit. So, full disclosure, this was my second attempt at launching. The first time I launched, I just pointed straight on the 90 degree vector on the nav ball. Uh, I just looked at the map screen and then subsequently slammed into the side of a cliff. So I have reloaded a quick save and tried again. This time I'm going to go straight up vertically and then I'll do like a manoeuvre to get myself circularised. But I think I was just in a bit of a daydream because I was like just sit sitting there looking at the plumes of the engines thinking oh isn't that pretty. And I was like oh my gosh yes Bob has like no gravity. So I went to the, uh, the map screen and we have this now ridiculously pointy orbit. But... You know, it's fine because Bop has low gravity. Look at this ridiculous maneuver node. It's only going to take me 92 meters per second of delta V to get into a circular orbit and encounter our target vessel. And yes, our orbit is very, very different to our target. We're at a massively different inclination. But again, because of Bop's low gravity, it's not going to take too much fuel to, you know, match speed with our target and thereby simultaneously matching orbits with our target. So here's me doing our first maneuver node or executing our first maneuver. Oh, I should say, they, they, I remember now, Nate asked us content creators way back in day, in like February or March when KSP2 first released. I remember getting a message from Nate Simpson asking all of us content creators to, yeah, try and call the maneuver nodes maneuver plans instead because it sounds a bit less intimidating. By the way, as you can see, we're back at three times time warp. The footage is subsequently playing back at 2,800% faster than real time speed to give you a sense of what I had to suffer through to get this mission done. Anyway, yeah, that was it. So he asked us on the behalf of the developer team to maybe start referring to them as maneuver plans rather than maneuver nodes because one of the big objectives of the developers of Kerbal Space Program 2 is to make the game a bit more beginner friendly, beginner accessible and by not having so many technical terms like maneuver node and having it called maneuver plan, intuitively that sounds a bit more understandable, doesn't it? But I, I kind of didn't do that <laughs> for a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, to be honest, to be brutally honest here, uh, force of habit. I just, I'm so used to calling the maneuver nodes, it's very difficult for me to suddenly break that mold. And secondly, I'm like, well, force of habit, it's very difficult for me to break that mold. And uh, really at the moment, the game is not in a state where new players should really be playing it because it's a very frustrating situation, Kerbal Space Program 2. But I guess now, you know, force science has come out suddenly, it is a much more user-friendly experience. When I, I, I haven't even said this yet, but the first time I played uh, exploration, I keep wanting to call it like career mode still. The first time I played exploration mode, I did it with my girlfriend who's never really played KSP before. And I was like, let me even play this together. It's gonna be more user-friendly. They give you contracts. So she, she could actually do it. And yeah, she, was, she sucked. Sorry, Beth, you suck at KSP. Uh, get good, but now the game is more, maybe I should try and put in a bit more of an effort now to call them maneuver plans rather than maneuver nodes. That was an awfully long tangent, wasn't it, for something so trivial and miss, I just missed the docking, didn't even talk about the docking, but feel like, you know, it was uh, pretty self-explanatory. Now, as you can see, viewers, we have 4,500-ish meters per second of delta v remaining, which is far in excess of what we actually need to get back to Kerbin. So I decided to get back to Kerbin the lazy way. We're just going to make a maneuver. We're going to make a maneuver plan. Yeah, maneuver plan. How, how cool is how good is that, eh? <laughs> We're going to make a maneuver plan uh, to get our um, orbit to intersect Kerbin's orbit. And then just after our periapsis, we'll make another wait for it, maneuver plan, and just drag on the retrograde marker, and then you'll just watch the close encounter nodes magically swing around and we'll get a nice easy curb encounter. Or so I thought, ooh, twists and turns. The excitement never ends in this video, it seems. Uh, so now, I, my, my eyes, they drift back to the screen to figure out whereabouts we are after I went to that massive, uh, let's be honest, it was way too long, my little thing about maneuver plans. But I guess, speaking of, that's where we're time warping to next. I made a maneuver plan just after the point at which we cross Kerbin's orbit. Well, actually, I tell a lie, we don't actually cross Kerbin's orbit, but I got it pretty close. So the bit of our orbit where we nearly cross Kerbin's orbit, we're going to do a very small retrograde burn. And look at those separation nodes just come a little bit closer. As you can see, we do not have a Kerbin encounter because our inclination is just way too off. So we're going to make another maneuver plan a little bit further on in our orbit because we need to do an inclination change. And those require less delta V the further away from the 
celestial object that you're orbiting is. So in this case, the sun. So I did it a little bit further on. And uh, yeah, it's not on screen at the moment, but wait for it. As you can see, our separation from Kerbin is actually pretty close. I couldn't, I was surprised that I wasn't actually getting an encounter pop up on the map screen. Okay, well right now we are kind of far away, but wait for a second. There we are, look, that's pretty close. 73,000 kilometers, which on an interplanetary scale is nothing. And yet no Kerbin encounter, so I decided this must be a glitch. So let's just time warp and sure enough, time warping for a bit suddenly made that encounter appear. So I'm not really sure what happened. Like why didn't the game recognize that I should be encountering Kerbin's sphere of influence? Like. I'm no coder, I've never claimed to be one either, uh, but my basic understanding of code, and I'm very, very open to being corrected here because it's probably a very, very ignorant statement to make, but my understanding of code is like, if this, then that. That's how programming works, right? You know, uh, computers look to see if something has been fulfilled, and if so, then that. And that's my understanding of coding. Uh, make sure you subscribe for more programming tips in the future. Gonna, gonna, Got a, got, a, got a vast array of knowledge learned from Stack Overflow and ChatGPT, so you know, buckle your seatbelts, let me tell you. I can write you one heck of a mean batch file. Um, do you want to hear a funny story? Speaking of batch files, uh, one thing I did, when I was when I was growing up, when I was growing up, so I must have been maybe like 13, 14 years old, at the time in the UK, it was quite common for internet service providers to have like a data cap on what you use. And I'm told this is still a thing in the US. I mean, maybe it's still a thing in the UK, but I've literally never seen one in my years of being an adult, uh, where you have like a data, like you can only use, I don't know, three terabytes of data before your internet starts charging you more. That's wild, but is that still a thing in America? I'm really sorry if it is, like that's that really sucks. But anyway, uh, this was a thing at the time when I was like, well, maybe it was just like my parents had some really cheap rubbish internet contract, who knows? I don't remember, I was an idiot 13 slash possibly 14 year old child. You know, all I cared about was, I don't know, Call of Duty. <laughs> but yeah, I, they, they said like, oh, we're close to using our data cap. This is, this is me doing impression of my parents, you know? <laughs> we're close to using our data cap. It's your fault, Matthew, with your PlayStation. We are blaming you. So I created a batch file and I basically I said, hey, look, I've got this program that I downloaded from the internet service provider's website that analyzes what is using all of your data. I don't know if my voice just changes then because I was proof watching this bit of the commentary and I thought to myself, you know what? I bet I've still got this batch file saved somewhere. So I had a little dig and lo and behold, I do. So, and I was watching it, and we're going, like, going through the menus, and I was like, this is really funny, and I think maybe the viewers would love to watch this, rather than, you know, the KSP mission that they obviously clicked on to watch. I'm now, I'm steering things away, so we can watch a rubbish batch file I made when I was 13 or 14, or I don't even know how old I was, to be honest. Here we are, so, uh, MTN, console internet usage meter. Would you like to check your con- yes, I'm gonna press yes. Oh, see, this is sneaky. It's like, oh, it's it's all the consoles that exist in the world. PS3 and 360, right? So I'm going to press 1 for PlayStation 3. That's what I had. Oh, now scanning. Please wait. Oh, this is very... It's clearly doing something, right? Because look at the... Whoa! My total usage for this mouse is just 2.34 gigabytes. I'm going to press any key to continue, and there we are. Console ID settings. Don't want to dox myself accidentally, but let's see. I'm gonna press M by something. There we go. Now scanning. Oh, yeah, you see, guys, it must be doing something because there's that little ellipsis that's got an animation. So let's see. Matthew's. <laughs> I hadn't even like checked this. That's not my uh, actual console ID, by the way. I don't even know if PS3s have console ID, but there we are. Let's close the program. What a. Oh, echo off. Clearly, I didn't mask that bit in the batch file editor, but it was fine. Well, there you are. There's a. A slice of life into my childhood, I guess. And we, we've landed. We landed on Kerbin during all of that. <laughs> and so I guess with the mission over, we can go to the uh, research and development building. And yes, I've, uh, I've finished my first ever contract. We launched a rocket. Um, so full disclosure, guys, just like I was dishonest with my parents with that batch file. I, uh, by the way, I do actually maintain my innocence here. PlayStation 3 internet does not use that much data. I was just playing Call of Duty. It's not that much. So, you know, I'm just saying. 
But just like my dishonesty there, I was dishonest here. I, I just used cheats to unlock the tech tree just to show you this cool mission. But I will be doing a full playthrough of the game properly soon. Loud Aerospace 3, the third one, in KSP 2, the second one.